Penny Patricia Bordeaux was born in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, Canada. She met a man by the name of Paul Bordeaux, and the two married. They had their first and only child together in 1996, a girl named Carissa. Penny and Paul's relationship was rocky, and Penny was unfaithful. Fast forward to the year 2008, Carissa was now 12 years old, and Penny was having an affair and started a relationship with a man by the name of Vernon McCumber. The two seemingly had a great relationship, but the only thing in the way for their relationship to reach a different level was Carissa. Vernon did not get along with Penny's daughter Carissa, and the two often argued. One day, Vernon had enough, and he gave Penny an ultimatum. He said to Penny, it's either her or me. Penny decided to choose a man over her own flesh and blood and began to hatch up a plan to rid her daughter from their lives for good. She did not want her affair to end, so she chose to do whatever it took to make Vernon happy. On January 27, 2008, Penny drove Carissa to a wooded area in the outskirts of Bridgewater. Penny then knocked Carissa down to the ground and began attacking her. Carissa's last words were, Mommy, don't, before Penny killed her. After Carissa's death, Penny pulled her pants off to make it look like she was killed for other reasons. Penny drove back home, and at around 7.30 p.m. that night, she called the Bridgewater police to notify them that her daughter was missing. When officers arrived to her house, she told them that she and Carissa went to the Bridgewater Mall, and she let Carissa stay inside of the car while she went inside of the store to shop. She said that she wanted to give Carissa some time to cool off because they had an argument. After returning to the car when her shopping was done, she noticed Carissa was not in the car. With that information, Penny's family and the police began a search for Carissa and an investigation began. Just two days after the death of Carissa, Penny went on live television pleading for her daughter to come home. She made everyone believe Carissa ran away from home because of, in her words, arguments of typical teenage things that weren't significant. On February 1st, Penny went on live local television yet again and was quoted saying, it's hard not to know where your kid is. Reporters asked police questions, and they informed reporters that they had no evidence to prove the pair was actually at the mall the day Carissa went missing. On February 9th, Carissa's body was discovered by a passerby on the bank of the Lahavi River below Highway 331 at 11.30 in the morning. Police brought two residents who lived near Carissa in for questioning, but they would not release the names of those two residents. On February 14th, the Bridgewater police went on the local news to host a press conference, letting everyone know that it was confirmed that the body found did indeed belong to Carissa. They also said, For us to do a proper job, we're going to take the time we need to take. A funeral was held at Carissa's father's house. Her father Paul lived with his parents in Shelburne County, and there were hundreds of people who showed up to pay their respects. Penny and her boyfriend Vernon attended the funeral together. Carissa was buried at the cemetery in Clarks Harbor on February 19th. On the 23rd, the community dubbed Carissa as Bridgewater's daughter, and nine churches held memorial services for her. The police were still conducting an investigation, and their eyes shifted towards Penny. An undercover officer posing as a gangster met up with Penny and offered to dispose of any evidence that would get her in trouble. Penny took the bait, and finally, after four months of investigation, police arrested Penny on June 13th and charged her with first-degree murder. Investigators feel confident that there was only one person responsible for this homicide. We do not expect anyone else to be charged in this case. Penny was taken to the Bridgewater Courthouse to be arraigned on June 16th. On October 22nd, Penny's lawyers waived Penny's rights to a preliminary hearing, and her case was then moved to the Supreme Court. On January 30th, 2009, Penny pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 20 years. In the end, she admitted that Carissa was just in the way of her relationship. Penny Boudreaux pleaded guilty to second-degree murder today, admitting she killed her 12-year-old daughter Carissa because the child was in the way of her relationship with her boyfriend. The court heard that Boudreaux had been contemplating the murder for several days. On January 27, 2008, she drove around with Carissa and stopped at the Bridgewater Sobey. She was was, uh, alive and and well when she was at the the parking lot at Sobey's and when uh, Ms. Boudreaux made the call to Mr. McCumber and reported her missing. She was still in the car, still alive, and uh, it was from there uh, at the Sobey's that she left, took her to the Williams Head Road and strangled her. Our understanding from, from what Ms. Boudreaux described, she was slumped in the passenger seat in the, the well area, uh, likely not visible to the public. 
Uh, and uh, at that point, she drove her up to Tim Hortons, took the twine, put it in a Tim Hortons cup, and put it into a Tim Hortons garbage can, where obviously with the many Tim Hortons cups would never be discovered. The understanding that we have for motive uh, appeared to be twofold from the statements she gave to the undercover operator. Uh, the first and primary motivating factor appeared to be that uh, she felt that Carissa's presence was a danger to the relationship continued between her and, and Vernon, and that she had to kill her to uh, take care of that problem. And secondly, uh, there was discussion by her about uh, this 12-year-old talking badly about her to friends and to people in the community, and she didn't want that to happen, uh, particularly uh, at this stage and that uh, those two appear to be the factors which uh, ended up motivating her to kill her daughter. Although the crime was obviously planned, the Crown accepted a guilty plea to second-degree murder to save the family the ordeal of a trial. This is a case where to give the family closure, to uh, give the community closure, to uh, prevent and spare the family the anguish of a trial, a life sentence for second degree murder uh, is the same as a life sentence for first degree murder. The question is when the person may first apply for parole, whether it's at uh, anywhere from 10 to 25 years or, or 25 years. And in this case, we had arrived with a joint submission uh, at a parole ineligibility period that was very high, 20 years, uh, and uh, felt that it was a fit and appropriate uh, resolution taking into account the life sentence regardless of whether it was first degree or second. For the family, hearing why Carissa died was difficult. I can't call anything other than a senseless act. I mean, the options were there. And, you know, for, for a parent to just make that decision, I still can't comprehend it. She had many options. There was many people around her that would have gladly, gladly, you know, had I known this was going to happen, I would never ever let her go back. But I mean, what parent's going to try to, you know, say, no, you can't go back and see your mother? Chris and I always had a special bond. I mean, and, and I feel a bad because of how things fall out, because my brother loved her just as much and spent more time than, than I did with her. I mean, he, he basically, he, if I wasn't there, he was there by her side. So, I mean, He's kind of got left uh, on, on the wayside, but I mean, he was just as much of a father to her as I was. Well, you know what's made me strong? Is spending time with the kids around me, around the community and that stuff. And I mean, them little kids, the children were devastated. I mean, how many children at that age have a best friend that's, that's brutally murdered? You know, you hear your friend's name across the TV, you know, every day constantly when it all first happened about, a, about a, your best friend or somebody you knew. There's, Children do not go through that very often. And from my working with the children and that stuff and talking to them, you know, that, that, that helped me through it. John Collier said he knows the case has been difficult for all involved, including investigators. We're, we're human beings too. Our, my members have uh, little ones as well. Uh, I have a daughter. Um, and this case in particular uh, resonated with all of them. Uh, and, but it, what it did was it strengthened our resolve to uh, bring uh, some closure to the community uh, and to the family and bring justice for Carissa. Just part off. Thank you all for watching another episode of Wicked Women. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below.